Christine's going to come up and give us our evening reading, which is Mark chapter 1, verse 1, and then verses 9 to 20. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptised by John in the Jordan. And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son, with you I am well pleased. The Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness, and he was in the wilderness forty days, being tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild animals, and the angels were ministering to him. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee, proclaiming the gospel of God, and saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Passing alongside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on a little farther, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were in their boat mending the nets. And immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and followed him. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. In the scriptures we have four gospels. Most of you will be very familiar with them. But they all are distinctive. They cover the 33, 33 and a half years of the time that the Lord Jesus spent on this earth. A few weeks ago, we celebrated Christmas when we remember that God, the Son, came into this world to be God with us. Born in Bethlehem, born in poverty, in relative obscurity, and at the age of 30, he began his public ministry. And of course, at the end of that, he was falsely accused. He was crucified. And 40 days later, after his resurrection, he ascended into heaven. His work done. And Mark is the shortest of the Gospels, thought to be the earliest written and if you think of the Gospels as being like newspapers, Mark would be a tabloid. Punchy. His favourite word, or one of his favourite words immediately, euthos, it appears something like 40 plus times in 16 chapters. Immediately this, immediately that. There's not a lot of detail. He's getting in the action, if you like, the headlines, what Jesus did, what Jesus said his actual life. In contrast, we have Matthew's Gospel, which was written really with a Jewish bent to, for, for a Jewish audience. Mark, we think of, or centres on Jesus as the servant. Matthew as Jesus the king. Luke, writing to a Gentile audience, majors on the favourite name that the Lord Jesus gave himself the Son of Man. And those three Gospels are called the Synoptic Gospels, literally seeing together. But then John is different. John was the youngest of the Lord's disciples, of his, the Apostles. He was the only one who wasn't martyred. He lived to an old age. And John's Gospel was written much later. And John concentrates not so much on action. He only has seven miracles in between the beginning of Jesus' ministry and his crucifixion. And he doesn't call them miracles, he calls them signs. And he goes to great length to explain who Jesus was, what he said, what he did, and why he did it. In fact, at the end of his gospel, he says, 
that these things were written. And he says why they were written. He says a bit of hyperbole here. He said if everything was written down that Jesus did in those three, three plus years, there wouldn't be enough room in the world for all the books. Well, that's uh, obviously slightly uh, a slight hyperbole. But his point is he'd selected, or the Holy Spirit through him had selected certain things, certain lessons. But he says these are written, John 20, 31, that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by leaving you may have life in his name. Mark begins his short gospel with verse 1 of chapter 1. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Straight there, if you like, he nails his colours to the mast. It's thought that he got a lot of his information, or most of his information, directly from the Apostle Peter. And he's straight in there. The gospel, the evangelion, the good, literally the good message. We usually call the gospel good news. It's the world, the news that the world needs. There's not much good news about it, is there? If you read newspapers, if you watch radio, uh, listen to the radio, watch the TV, or get your news from, um, from the internet and from uh, various platforms, there's not a lot of good news about. But the gospel is the good news. In fact, it's the best news. It's the most important news, of course, that anybody can hear. But it is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Or literally, Jesus, that's his name. Christ is a title. The Messiah. God's anointed prophet, priest, and king. Of course, he'd been announced through the Old Testament. The Old Testament prophets had gradually given a, a, a continual, a progressive unveiling of the Messiah. The God's anointed one who is going to come. Messiah, of course, is Hebrew. Um, and Christ, Christos, is the Greek. But it's the same thing. It's God's anointed. But the prophets of the Old Testament spoke from God. But the Lord Jesus spoke uniquely as God. And, of course, he was God's anointed priest. A priest who interceded between man and God. Spoke to God for man. But uniquely, the unique high priest who didn't just offer sacrifices, but he offered one sacrifice himself for all time. And of course, God's anointed king. And he reigns now as King Jesus. And one day, we don't know when. It may be very soon. But one day he's coming back gloriously and he's going to put this sorry world of greed, selfishness, war affliction, world of suffering, man's inhumanity to man, physical suffering, all the results of sin and rebellion, our rebellion, rebellion against God. That's all going to be, this world's going to be wrapped up, finished, and there's going to be new heavens and new earth. And as God's people, as those who are trusting in the Lord Jesus for our salvation, for now and for eternity, we will be with him forever in the new heavens and the new earth. So Mark straight straight away and says, this is where I'm beginning. This is the beginning of the gospel, the good news of Jesus. Jesus, of course, means God saves. Matthew 1, 21, the angel said to Joseph, you shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save, not attempt to save, he shall save his people from their sins, from the penalty of their sins, from the power and practice of their sins, and ultimately from the presence of their sins. And Mark goes on quickly. He talks about briefly about John the Baptist, and John the Baptist who came as the forerunner, the herald after 400 years of silence 
Nothing was heard from God. A lot happened, but we don't read about it. We don't read the prophets had no word from God. And then suddenly, John the Baptist appeared on the scene. And we find that where we began our reading down at verse um, 9 there, or the second part, that Jesus came from Nazareth and he was baptised by John in the Jordan. And this was going to be the beginning of his public ministry. He immediately saw the heavens torn open. The spirit descended on him like a, a, a dove. And a voice came from heaven. One of the three times recorded in the Gospels that God endorsed his son. You, you, Jesus, you are my beloved son. With you, I am well pleased. In English, we fail to recognise just what being called the son of meant in the culture, in, in Judaism at the time, in Israel at the time. To be called the son of God meant you shared the deity of God. That in effect you were saying you were equal with God. That's the main reason why the, the Jewish leaders hated him and tried to do away with him. And in the end had trumped up charges and had him crucified. It wasn't because he went around doing good. It wasn't going doing that he went around healing the sick and casting out demons. It was because he made himself equal with God. To them, that was the ultimate blasphemy. No, he was the son of God, uniquely the son of God. No other saviour, no other mediator between man and God. There's only peace. There's only reconciliation with God. There's only forgiveness of sins in Christ Jesus. And so we find he was baptised. And here we see one of three ends which we're going to look at tonight, briefly just as short headings. The might of the Lord Jesus. The message of the Lord Jesus. And the mission of the Lord Jesus. Might, message and mission. The might I guess we'd better say the authority, the exousia of Christ. His authority, because he spoke from God, but he spoke as God. Yes, he was a true man. He was a human being as we are, flesh and blood. He was born as we are. He developed and grew as we did. He shared our humanity, but he never ceased to be God. He was the God-man. And his authority, a mark, is keen to establish. In fact, if we were going through this chapter in a series, you find the authority of the Lord Jesus all the way through. His authority in his teaching. As he taught, the crowds were amazed at his teaching. His authority over sickness as he healed the sick who were brought to him, and his authority over evil spirits whom he cast out. He manifested his greatness. Why, were, why did he perform the miracles? To show, to demonstrate that he was who he said he was. But when we find that um, immediately after his baptism, the spirit drove him into the wilderness. That's weak in our English. In the Greek, if you look at that literally, he was thrown out, he was driven out, compelled out by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted, tested, tried by Satan. And his authority over Satan John doesn't go into any details. In other Gospels we read, Matthew 4 for example, uh, of the detail of three of those trials, those temptations. And in each of them the Lord Jesus conquered Satan by the word of God. His authority over everything, including the devil himself. 
But secondly, verse 14, John the Baptist was arrested. Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel, the good news, the good message of God. And what did Jesus say? What are the first recording of the words? The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. I'm conscious here I'm speaking to via the camera there and via the internet and the various platforms. Many people all over the place, maybe across the world. I can't see you. But when you watch this recording, you'll see me. You'll hear what's being said. Do you know the gospel? Do you know what the gospel is? Do you know the good news of the gospel? Do you understand the gospel? Have you believed the gospel? Have you repented? That's the most crucial thing for all of us. You see, the gospel is good news. It's a good message. But only for those who heed it, who obey it. It's interesting. The Lord Jesus never made a request. He never gave an invitation in the sense of, well, here I am. Here's my message. You can take it or leave it. It's an imperative. It's a command. Repent and believe in the gospel. But what does it mean to repent? There's a lot of misunderstanding about repentance. It's often thought it's just a change of direction. But it actually literally means a change of mind. Meta change, noia, from gnosis, the mind, the thinking. That's why the gospel is preached. That's why the gospel is spoken. God is a speaking God. The Bible, his word, is the written record of God speaking through men he appointed. It begins with why, why we're here, where we came from. In the beginning, God. And God created by speaking things, by the authority of his power. And he's a speaking God. And the gospel is, comes through preaching. Faith comes by hearing the preaching of Christ. It is the gospel, the good news of the Son of God, of Jesus the Christ. And so Jesus said, the kingdom of God is at hand. It's now come. I have come to usher it in, to bring it. How do you enter the kingdom of God? You enter it by repenting, by changing your mind about yourself, about your own ways, your own efforts to try and be good, to think that you can satisfy God by yourselves. We can't. And none of us can. Only the perfect one, the Son of God who was sinless, could satisfy God's justice. Because God's holy. God has to punish sin. God cannot just wink at it. God cannot just turn, turn it away and count it as nothing. And that punishment for sin was made in his Son. And so Jesus says, repent. You hear the gospel. You recognise, you accept, you recognise that it's speaking to you, that you're a sinner, that you've fallen short of God's righteous standard. And you repent and you believe. And literally, you believe into. You believe into Christ. You become united with Christ. Sadly, so much of evangelism today is superficial. It speaks about believing in the sense of just giving mental assent to facts. Do you believe that you're a sinner? Do you believe that Jesus came and died for sinners? Do you believe that if you believe these facts, you will go to heaven? That's not the essence of the gospel. The gospel is trusting and continuing to believe, continuing to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. The most famous verse in the Bible, John 3.16 in our English translations, doesn't give the literal sense of it. It's literally, this is how God demonstrated, God showed his love. He so loved the world, he loved the world in this way, that he gave his son the one and only, 
that whoever believes and keeps on believing, it's the continu continuous present in the Greek, in the original, and keeps on believing into, into him, should not perish, but have everlasting life, having eternal life. It's not just a one-off made a decision, ticked a card, and that's it. It's a complete change of thinking. You see, our minds control our emotions and our wills in that order. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. And that's why it's important that we don't weaken the gospel, that we don't mislead people, that we don't deceive people into false assurance. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation to all who believe. So Jesus came and this is the message, repent and believe in the gospel. And then we find verse 16, passing alongside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net into the sea. They were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. He didn't say, well, you've got a good business there. I've got a proposition for you. Why don't I give you this proposition and why don't you weigh it up and maybe I'll pop by next week, next month and see whether you want to continue as you are or you want to come and follow me. It's a command. Later when Jesus um, saw Matthew, Levi, the tax collector, a, um, a traitor to the Jews working for the Romans and ripping off his own countrymen, Jesus didn't say, why don't you leave that and follow me? It was a command, follow me. It was always a command. The gospel is a command. Romans starts, Romans 1, and ends with obey the gospel. It's obedience. To believe into Christ is to obey Christ. We obey the gospel. God commands. That's always the case. At Pentecost, when Peter, the, the, the Spirit fell, and, and the people were convicted and they cried out, what shall we do? What's the first word? Repent. Repent. It's a command. Repent. And in Acts 17, when we have the Paul going, if you like, his first sermon, his first evangelistic sermon to a Gentile audience, there on Mars Hill, God says what? God now commands men everywhere to repent. To ignore, to refuse the gospel, is an act of disobedience. Disbelief, unbelief, and disobedience. It's refusing to obey God. And here you find amazingly the message enacted here. Jesus said to them, follow me. But you see, they had work to do, and I will make you become fishers of men and immediately they left their nets and followed him and going a little farther he saw James the son of Zebedee and John his brother who were in their boat mending the nets and immediately he called them and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and followed him see how many times already Mark's used the word immediately it's bap zap 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 it's Mark's gospel is all action I often say to people who aren't familiar with the scriptures, you're going to start to read, start at Mark's gospel. Because in many respects, it's the most accessible of the gospels. And you see just the, the ministry of the Lord Jesus and, and the working there. But notice what Jesus said to them. Follow me and I'm going to give you something to do. You see, you've had Jesus' authority or Jesus' might. We've got the message of the gospel, the good news of salvation in Christ. Peace with God through faith in the Lord Jesus, being justified by being declared not guilty by faith in him, by believing, acting on, and continuing to believe, and our lives are changed. But you see, the Lord Jesus ascended to heaven God could have sent angels to preach the good news but he didn't 
He uses human beings. He uses you and me. I will make you become fishers of men. Notice we started off with his authority. If you flick your eyes, just you might not even have to turn the page. The last two, three verses in Matthew. We've well known the Great Commission. People often start with verse 19. What's the Great Commission? Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, etc. But notice where it starts. All authority in heaven on earth, said Jesus, has been given to me. He's the one with the authority. And therefore, and it's not go as a command there, an imperative. It's a participle. As you go, I remember some, some of as many as youngsters were, can remember going to missionary meetings and so on. And the impression was given that the people who this applied to are people who go out as missionaries and you've got to go off somewhere else. What Jesus is saying, wherever you happen to be, with my authority, you are, and there's only one imperative in the Great Commission, make disciples. What's a disciple? The disciple's a learner. You see, it's hearing, it's knowing the gospel, knowing the word of God. Make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And behold, I'm with you always to the end of the age. So, we have, when we are sharing the good news of Jesus Christ, it's in the authority of Christ, it's in the power of Christ, through his Holy Spirit. We can't convert anybody. We can't change anybody's mind, anybody's thinking. And think back, if you're in Christ, if you're a believer, you didn't decide of yourself, this is a good idea. Why did you, the lights turn on? Because God, by his spirit, illuminated your thinking. Paul says, writing to the Corinthians, I love this passage, beginning of 2 Corinthians chapter 4, he says, people don't get it. If our gospel's hidden, if it's veiled, it's because the God of this world, small g, Satan, has blinded the minds of unbelievers. That's why they don't get it. But he says, we don't preach ourselves. We preach Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your bond slaves, for his sake. And I love verse 6. For it's the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness. When was that? Genesis chapter 1. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. It's God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, who turns the lights on, who changes our thinking so that we suddenly see that we're sinners, that we're under God's judgment, and that we need a saviour, and reveals the Lord Jesus to us. The mission is done through us but it's not our power it's the power of God what a privilege what a responsibility not all are called to be public speakers and to be bible teachers but we're all called to be witnesses we all have a responsibility to use the opportunities and to pray for opportunities in a world in a society of in this country Really, effective paganism. People don't know. When we were small, most of us, we went to schools where you had a Christian assembly. You sang a Christian hymn, you had a Christian reading. Everybody knew the Lord's Prayer. Religious education was compulsory, and it was Christian education. And nearly all children had a basic understanding and familiarity with basic Bible stories and knew who Jesus was. Now... Very few. Now, very few. But the Lord Jesus didn't. He said, I will build my church, my called out people. And the gates of hell will not prevail. It's his work, it's his authority, but it's mediated through us. How active do we want to be? There's a big danger if we've been Christians for a long time, especially if we're, we're older. 
to think we're elderly, we've done our bit. We'll just cruise our way now till the Lord calls us home or he returns, whichever comes first. Behind every great work of God, really, there's been prayer. I'd love to think the last true revival, I guess, in the British Isles was on the Isle of Lewis between 49 and 52. Christian and I were both born in that interval. And um, it was too... <laughs> it's ironic that... Uh, I, I don't forget the names of the two elderly ladies, Christine and Peggy Smith. One was totally blind, the other was bent double with arthritis. They were housebound in their little cottage. But they prayed, and they prayed that the Lord would... They saw the debauchery, the drunkenness, the immorality, the total state of the society on the island at that time. And they prayed. And the Lord sent along the evangelist. And uh, at first he wasn't interested in going there. He was on big things. And I think it was Peggy who said to him, if you were as walked as cl lived as close to the Lord as I do, you'd know he wants you to come here. And the rest is history. He did. And in the middle of the night, the church was open. The lights were on. People coming out of the pub, pub, pubs, the drunks... Were coming, and they were convicted and they were weeping and they were crying out we need what must we do to be saved but God doesn't often work in that way his usual way is by you and me the ones and the twos we all enter the kingdom we all become believers one at a time but we're all called to be fishers of men to catch them to bring people in, and that's generic men, not just men, <laughs> ladies included, everybody, boys, girls. That's our responsibility. So we don't lose heart. As Paul says right into the Corinthians, in 2 Corinthians 4, we don't lose heart. He's talking to the Corinthians there about the suffering, his imprisonments. He, he said at one stage in chapter 1 there, he says, we thought we'd receive the sentence of death. But we're not losing heart. Because as men commissioned by God, in the sight of God, we preach Christ. That's the gospel, that's the good news. So don't despair, don't be despondent. God is working his purpose out for his glory. Be persistent in prayer and pray that he will raise up and thrust out workers into his harvest field for his glory. Amen.